Welcome to today's webinar, The Secrets to Mastering the Art of SOW Management. I'm Deborah Bergevine, Vice President of Marketing at DCR Workforce, and I will be your host for today's session. Before we start, let's take a moment to review a few things you may need to know. Today's webinar will run the full 60 minutes that was scheduled for the event. All attendees will receive a copy of today's presentation, so there's no need to take copious notes. And in addition, a replay will be made available starting tomorrow if you missed anything or you want to share this webinar with others in your organization. We'll send you access details via email. If you've experienced any issues whatsoever with the webinar, please contact the WebEx Help Desk. And finally, we encourage audience questions. To submit a question, all you need to do is enter your question into the Q&A box. And of course, any unanswered questions will be addressed by our team via email after the session. If you dialed in via phone, uh, you may want to send us a quick note reminding us that you were on the webinar. And that way, we can expedite sending you a copy of the presentation. Submitting questions is easy. Click on the question mark icon at the top, go to the text box, enter your question, and then select who you would like to address the question to. Let me take a moment to tell you about DCR Workforce. We provide total talent and service procurement solutions. That means we offer the guidance, strategy, operational assistance, and the technology needed to manage all workers and the agencies that provide those workers. This includes contingent workers, perm employees, freelancers, and project teams delivering SOW-based services. We are now in our 21st year of operation, with, and we are serving clients around the globe. We're currently managing statement of work programs for about 40 companies that are managing anywhere between a dozen to 100 very large projects at any given point in time. Those of you who are contemplating or executing SOW program know that it is a very complex space that requires a great deal of planning and careful execution. So today, I'm joined by Christopher Dwyer, Research Director and Vice President of Operations at Arden Partners. Chris will share research and insights into the current state of SOW management, as well as best practices for successful programs. And I'll then describe DCR's approach and highlight the experiences of our clients. I'm so pleased that Chris is joining us today. Many of you are familiar with his research and his insightful CPO Rising articles and blogs. He's a recognized expert in spend management and contingent workforce management. In each of the past two years, Chris has been named an analyst superstar by HRO Today. And he was recognized as a pro to know by Supply and Demand Chain Executive Magazine in 2014. Over the past decade, he's authored more, authored more than 300 research studies and reports on the evolution of the non-employee workforce. Chris? Heard my voice before, even read, uh, read our research. Um, very, very excited to be here. Um, you know, uh, my past, uh, my, my career as an analyst over the past decade, uh, I've written on numerous topics, uh, none so much as evolutionary or as exciting uh, as, as the non-employee workforce. So uh, very particularly excited to be here today to talk about this topic. A little bit about Arden Partners. Uh, Arden Partners is now in its <clears throat> sixth year of existence. Uh, it was founded by a gentleman named Andrew Bartolini, who himself is a guru and uh, longtime analyst in the uh, supply management and procurement space. Uh, Andrew started the firm uh, with the one goal of uh, defining, advancing, and promoting uh, the next-gen uh, solutions, technologies, strategies, and capabilities uh, that can really drive organizational transformation and of course, drive true business value. I think in one uh, high-level sentence, uh, you know, we really are uh, the firm that evangelizes um, the uh, evolution of, of supply management in, in the procurement group. But <clears throat> don't let that scare you because, um, you know, even though at, at heart um, I uh, have always been a supply management procurement analyst, um, my heart really has been within the contingent workforce management research topic. So, um, 
you know, even though, uh, you know, we, we do frequently take the approach of, of procurement or the CPO or sourcing in regards to managing the non-employee workforce, uh, our research is uh, so evolutionary that uh, we are not just merely focused on sort of the spend management or the procurement aspects of the non-employee workforce. And to give you a little bit of an idea of <clears throat> how we tackle the contingent workforce topic, I'd like to very quickly uh, outline, um, you know, art and scope of, of CWM research. And, you know, throughout the course of the webinar, I use a ton of terms to describe the non-employee workforce, uh, you know, whether it's contingent workforce, contract talent, independent talent. Uh, to me, all of those areas are really, all those phrases are really interesting changeable. So <clears throat> Uh, I think the most important aspect of our research is that it revolves on the idea of evolution. Um, you know, you guys have heard the term flex economy. Uh, we know what the non-employee workforce is. We are moving into a world of on-demand talent where any one of us can source, find, engage, and hire talent on our smartphones, on our tablets, on our computers. We don't have to pick up the phone anymore. We don't have to send a resume out. Or we don't have to create a requisition. Uh, so many different avenues for sourcing talent, and we're very excited to be able to uh, capture that evolution in our research. Innovation. Uh, I think when you look across the entire spectrum of businesses today, innovation is happening all around us, whether it's mobile apps, whether it's um, you know, new cloud-based technologies, whether it's how information is stored, accessed, and analyzed. There are so many emerging technologies, and it's a very, very exciting time, um, you know, to, to, to be in this business. And uh, Ardent is always uh, very pleased to be able to be on the forefront of innovation and capturing that in our research. And finally, collaboration. Like I said, um, you know, some of the topics I cover, like, you know, spend, an spend analytics or, you um, or, or the evolution of strategic sourcing, or even something like travel and expense management, you know, business travel, events, things like that, that really fall on the indirect side of, of the spend management house. Um, I am a procurement analyst at heart. It's how I got my start years and years ago. Uh, but <clears throat> for the sake of the research, we can't just talk about procurement. We need to identify other areas of collaboration from, from talent management uh, to, to spend management and, of course, uh, leveraging the best of human capital principles and processes. So um, collaboration is a big part of our contingent workforce research. So <clears throat> the uh, agenda for today, uh, we're very, very excited to, to, to have a, a really a full webinar. I mean, it's, uh, you know, this isn't just a, a quick half hour <laughs> webcast where you're going to learn a thing or two. I mean, there's really a ton of information that we're packing in uh, into today's event. And um, uh, to be honest, if we had 120 minutes, I don't think we could fill it all. But um, you know, we're very, very excited for, for uh, what we're going to show you today. Um, after we get the intro and back, uh, introductions background out of the way, which I think we've done already, we'll dive into the, the evolving workforce. I mean, some market trends and sort of painting a picture of why <coughs> SOW, of all things, really is uh, um, sort of uh, the evolutionary path of, of contingent workforce management today. We'll use that as a nice segue into talking about what I call complex contingent workforce management, uh, which really revolves around managing the components of SOW and services and sort of the inner workings of all of that. And um, this phrase I'm going to use a lot today, the next frontier. You will get sick of that word or that phrase by the end of the webcast, but there's a reason we're using it so much. Um, I'll unveil some recommendations for action. I mean, I always feel it's my duty as an analyst um, to really put education at, at the forefront. Um, and we'll make sure that, you know, there's a nice nice bow on today's webinar. You know, there's, there's three or four key recommendations that I think everyone in, in the audience, whether you're a very immature contingent workforce uh, professional or uh, you're one of those uh, organizations that has, uh, has been around for a long time and, and has had some type of non-employee workforce program, uh, you know, for, for decades. Uh, I think there's really something uh, for everyone to learn today. Uh, as Deb had said, uh, Deb will uh, describe the <coughs> the uh, DCR workforce approach to SOW management. And uh, before uh, we wrap up, of course, we'll take as many questions as we can from the audience. And, and as Deb had said as well, uh, if we don't get to your questions today, uh, please don't fret. Um, we will be following up with everyone individually on questions that don't get addressed within uh, within the webinar today. So an evolving workforce, um, you know, the, it's really an exciting time uh, in, in, in the non-employer workforce industry, and um, I will use that word a lot, exciting. Um, you know, I really think that 
there's uh, no other space in businesses today, and I'm sure there's people out there that could argue with me, uh, that is as evolutionary or as exciting as the non-employee workforce. And one thing that I think about a lot, um, you know, just day-to-day -day being, being an industry analyst, uh, is the fact that this isn't an area that just affects, you know, one vertical or one industry. It doesn't just affect one region or it doesn't affect one sort of functional area or one role within the typical organization. You think of the non-employee workforce and you think, well, obviously the business is in the center. I mean, they, they are the organizations that are using uh, non-employees and freelancers and independent talent. But there's sort of another side of the coin there, and that's the, the workers themselves. I mean, think of just the economic market out there that more and more uh, professionals are turning to the freelancer out, they're turning to the contractor out uh, to showcase their talents and skill sets. They're not tying themselves down to one organization. So that's that's sort of not necessarily a hidden aspect of, um, you know, what we call the flex economy, but it is something that I think adds a little bit more weight to uh, how companies or how businesses really manage their, their non-employee workforce. And that's what really makes it exciting is that, um, you know, when you think of the business side, the, uh, the you know, the, the, the talent side, and then just how those two components sort of uh, impacting each other, impacting the entire global economic marketplace. And that's, that's, that's where you get something that's, that's really exciting. I mean, five years ago, maybe even six years ago, you didn't really see a lot of, of news or a lot of media around, uh, you know, terms like freelancers and independent contractors. I mean, I'm sure in the mid-90s, late-90s, uh, everyone saw a lot of high-profile cases when it, when it came to uh, contractor compliance or labor compliance. And, um, and, you know, I don't want to say the names of the companies out loud, but they are household names that went through some pretty significant ramifications as a result of uh, just having poor management of, of, uh, of their non-employees. Um, but, uh, you know, in today's, uh, today's uh, market, in today's business, uh, it's a big part of it. I mean, I think a lot of it's driven by uh, how workers are sourced today, the evolving uh, sources of talent. Um, you know, there's a phrase that, you know, that, that, that a lot of, of journalists use and a lot of even just business people use, you know, the, Uber, uh, the, the Uberization of, uh, of the workforce. And that's where you get something called, you know, the gig economy, the flex economy, flexible workforce. You know, I mean, all these phrases are being thrown around. But they, it all comes down to one thing, that a big chunk of our workforce today is considered non-employee and that that's not changing anytime too soon. And uh, some of the current market trends, as found by Arden's research over the past year, uh, you know, uh, nearly 50% of the world's workforce, uh, in, in our view, within the next few years, will be considered non-employee, non-traditional, non or freelance, or independent, or flex, or whatever you want to call it. That's huge. I mean, you think of today, yeah, you know, 30-year workforce today, in some organizations, you guys may be shaking your heads and saying, well, Chris, it's even smaller than that. And I'm sure there's others that will say, you know, Chris, we're already at 40, 50, 55% uh, of our workforce that's, uh, you know, in and out in a freelance or, or contract basis. Um, but I think, you know, you, for totality's sake, and you're sort of looking at where this space is going to go, I think, uh, you know, it, it's going to get even bigger than it is today. And, and rightfully so, 92% uh, of companies today perceive their contingent workforce as a vital component of their overall business. I mean, we're not talking about something that only impacts a small portion of the average business. We're talking about something that uh, affects everything. I mean, from uh, from an IT freelancer, from a finance freelancer, to, um, you know, temporary workers working on administrative projects, uh, to even, you know, uh, very uh, special, specific, specified skill sets that can only be found uh, in the services world or in the freelancer world. Um, it's really changing the dynamics of business today. So a changing face of, of, of contingent workforce management today, uh, one very exciting finding that came out of the, um, the, the research over the past uh, you know, 10 or 11 months was the, the, the need for talent and skill sets for years and years. And you know, for those of you who have been following me for quite some time, you know that I, you know, I was at another research firm uh, for seven years prior to joining uh, Ardens back in early 2013. And even back then, the when when I was putting together a research study and we asked organizations, uh, you know, what's your top challenge in managing your contingent workforce, your non-employee workforce? Uh, the top challenge is always, you know, as you can probably guess, cost, cost, 
cost savings, cost reductions. Um, and I think that has, uh, that was a direct result. I mean, of course, we knew it was growing. I mean, five years ago, you know, maybe 20% of the workforce was, was non-employee. Uh, maybe 2012, that was starting to get up into 25%. And then, of course, a few years later, here we are where, you know, nearly a third of the workforce is uh, considered non-employee. Um, the the need to drive down costs or improve cost reductions or cost savings, I mean, that's always going to come out on top. But what we see here today is that when we ask organizations what their challenges are, it's not just a reduction of total costs associated with non-employees. The need for talent and skill sets today outweighs the uh, sort of the uh, the burden or the pressure of um, of cost savings or uh, cost reductions, and that really speaks to uh, how much this industry has evolved over the past few years. And then, of course, something we're going to talk about a ton today, uh, lack of visibility and intelligence. I mean, I think if you, uh, I may have sort of skipped over a finding from the previous slide, but one of the um, the sort of stage setting findings that I had uh, put in that previous slide was uh, the idea that only 45% on average of a company's total uh, non-employee workforce uh, can be accounted for when they're forecasting, budgeting, or doing global planning. That's significant because that's less than half of a workforce that's growing rapidly, has significant impact. The companies just don't have visibility into it. They can't really wrap their arms around it. And that's, of course, one of the many reasons that that I think uh, organizations across the globe, um, you know, are are in the in the market, or they're um, they're really ready uh, to move on and, and improve or enhance their their programs. So there's <clears throat> this balancing act today uh, for contingent workforce programs and non-employee workforce programs, and. Um, and again, it all really boils back down to evolution. I mean, we're not talking about a very simple category of spend anymore. This isn't something that procurement can tackle alone. And, you know, at, at the core, I mean, it's always going to be about costs and budgets. I mean, I think when organizations are looking at their contingent workforce, as, I was, as I've been saying, cost, budget, you know, project expenses, things like that, that's always going to be one of the issues. But as this workforce has evolved, we've really seen the um, the impact of talent and quality. You know, what's the real effect of our non-employee workforce? I mean, these just aren't faceless workers that are coming in, doing a very simple job or, um, or, or managing very simple tasks, and then they're leaving. And then, you know, everyone's happy and you know, we got a project done that, you know, we didn't have to use another resource for. It's not like that anymore. A lot like that anymore. The vast majority of organizations today are very concerned about the quality of their talent and really the, you know, the underlying skill sets and the impact of that talent. And that's, you know, that's way off on the other side. I mean, costs and talent, you know, spend and, and talent, those are those aren't even two sides of the same coin. I mean, they're completely on opposite ends of the table, and that's why this is becoming more of a balancing act for professionals today. We know now that the non-employee workforce supports critical business endeavors. I mean, we're not, as I said, we're not just talking about some very very simple tasks that are being utilized, and that's not saying that that's not happening today. Um, you know, still, I mean, there's a big chunk of uh, of you know, we call them quote unquote temps, temporary workers that you're sourcing via staffing, uh, your staffing suppliers, your staffing agencies, and that's never going to change. I mean, that's really, you know, that's the foundation of, of the non-employee workforce today. Are those very traditional sources of labor. Um, we're never going to we're never going to get beyond that, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I think it's when you start uh, utilizing non-employee workers to fulfill more critical business tasks. Maybe it's a technology implementation. Maybe it's a big legal case. Maybe it's something involving finance and financial information that you know you need a real expert to come in and and, and help you or or or, or, to, or to make that impact. That's when we're starting to see, and we've been seeing this over the past couple of years, more and more non-employees and freelance and independent talent supporting those very crucial projects and endeavors. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, driving visibility and intelligence. Everyone, I mean, raise your hand if you're sick of the term big data. You know, my hand's up. I mean, I'm sick of hearing the idea. I'm sick of hearing that phrase. But there's something about it. There's the idea of intelligence, the idea of analytics today, the idea of visibility. 
I mean, these, these, these aspects are here to stay. I mean, there's no getting around the fact that as an organization in 2015, if we want to be successful, we want to combat globalization, uh, we want to act like a large enterprise-sized company and, and, and be as successful as some of those household names. And, you know, there's com you know, tons of different in industries. You know, there's hundreds of people on the line today. And, um, I, you know, I bet you're from all different uh, industries and verticals. And, you know, at the end of the day, what's the number one thing you want to do? I mean, you want to maintain some competitive advantage um, over all the other businesses in your space. And, and the way to do that is to have a foundation of visibility and intelligence that, that gives you sort of a third eye, so to speak, to it lets you um, look ahead to the future based on the information today. And you think of all these things together, and really it's, it puts a lot of complex pressure on today's programs. And um, it's not easy today to be someone that's in charge of running an unemployed workforce or has some type of responsibility. And, um, you know, that's, that's why we're here today, to help, <laughs> help you get over this and, uh, and get to the next level. So uh, the evolution of the non-employee workforce, like I said, evolution is a phrase you're going to hear a lot today amongst some other phrases. Uh, in the past, and I'm not saying that freelancers and independent contractors just showed up a couple of years ago. They've been around for a long time. They've been around you know, for, for decades and decades. But the core of the non-employee workforce years and years ago was primarily staffing-based. I mean, I think that um, you know, when you look at um, Ardent's contingent workforce management framework, uh, and this is a um, our official, uh, you know, patented, unique framework that we publish in our research to allow companies uh, to utilize it sort of as a blueprint for, you know, either building a program or enhancing their program. You know, there's there's three areas. There's uh, uh, staffing in traditional temporary labor. There's complex contingent labor, which is we're going to be talking about that a lot today. That's your SOW and services. And then there's also your freelancers and independent contractors and the demand talent, which can really be its own monster altogether. Um, but years and years ago, really the foundation of the non-employee workforce was, was primarily staffing based. I mean, um, you know, you didn't see as many freelancers and independent contractors today as you did 20 years ago. And that's why, um, you know, that, that's a good starting point for, for the evolution. <clears throat> you know, five or six years ago, I think we started to see more around the term SOW. I think a lot more complexities were, were being brought into the non-employee workforce and how companies were managing this type of talent. Um, and uh, as uh, the non-employee workforce started to get more complex and uh, it started to grow and it started to impact more and more organizations, uh, I think that the idea of total talent or uh, looking at your non-employee workforce or looking at your contingent workforce program from a talent-led perspective, um, you know, that's, that's where, you know, that's where we're headed. I mean, they were heading to an area where, and some companies may already be there today, but the vast majority of organizations are looking ahead. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out a way where, um, because it's getting so big, because it's becoming so impactful, and because there are so many new types of uh, services and sources of, of independent talent available, uh, companies want to take that talent-led approach. But there's one thing that a lot of organizations are, um, are forgetting as they get lost in the excitement of total talent. And that's why I think the companies need to take a little bit of a step back and try to focus on the SOW and complexity side of the non-employee workforce. You know, the way that I think about it is you can't get to that promised land. You can't get to that sort of higher ground if you don't master, um, you know, some of the items that are supposed to come before you get to that, that, that sort of, you know, that, that promised land, that higher ground. And, uh, hence why we're here today. SOW, it's, it is the next frontier. I mean, I think, uh, and it's been <laughs> the next frontier for a few years now. And that's not going to change. I mean, I think there are there's some great organizations out there that have really mastered um, how they manage SOW and how they manage um, the portion of their workforce that's linked to these types of agreements. And it's more project-based. It's more services-oriented. It's not as simple as bringing someone in, uh, letting them do what they have to do, and then releasing them and, you know, letting a contract or uh, an assignment end. It goes so much deeper than that that I really think that organizations um, at this point need to ask themselves, are we ready? Um, <clears throat> when 
companies look at their non-employee workforce, there's there's a variety of questions that they can ask. There are a variety of hurdles and challenges. Um, I think one issue is uh, how companies can overcome very outdated cultural biases. And, you know, you think of something, I mean, just the term itself, you know, statement of work, SOW, it's just a type of agreement, right? Isn't it just a, uh, you know, some type of uh, uh, agreement between us and, and a service or us and, and a contract or us and independent talent? It's a lot more than that. And I think that's why so many so many organizations, so many business leaders say, hey, it's, it's not a priority. And I think that's something that uh, needs to change. When we think about something like globalization, we think of <clears throat> how much pressure there is on CPOs today, how much pressure there is on procurement executives today. Um, SOW may not may not be a priority here. I mean, I've heard so many business leaders say, you know, that our procurement team really needs to focus on more strategic areas. And, you know, something like SOW, something like complex contingent labor, that's just tactical. That's something that can be solved by simple processes or enhancement to certain capabilities within our program. Um, and they're forgetting that it is a strategic area <laughs> and needs to be focused on. Uh, and then also, the non-employee workforce does not impact us beyond the realm of talent. And um, and that's, I think, companies are just starting to get ahead of themselves. Remember, you can't get to sort of that best-in-class level of success. You can't get to... Um, you know, your program isn't going to be perfect unless you you figure out a way to master traditional components, uh, current components, and sort of figure out a way where both the tactical and the strategic uh, are being managed in a very, uh, you know, predictable or repeatable or consistent manner. Um, and I think the companies are really getting ahead of themselves when, you know, they're getting too far ahead. I mean, yeah, talent's the contingent workforce, the non-employee workforce today, I'm not going to lie, it is about talent. It is about finding talent, engaging it, bringing it into our organization, um, you know, figuring out a way to, to get the most out of our talent, get the most out of our resources, and manage it all effectively. It's just that we can't get to this very perfect area where everything revolves around talent unless we master something like SOW. Skepticism, a big problem. Too many companies are skeptical of applying additional resources, solutions, technology, budget, all those items to SOW management. The question we often hear is, where is the value? And really, and we're going to get uh, into this, uh, you know, within the next, uh, next 15, 20 minutes, the value is visibility. The value is intelligence. The value is knowing who your workers are, knowing where they are, knowing how they are, and knowing what their impact is. And um, in the next section, we're going to talk about some of the SOW impact areas and why that really is just, uh, um, there's so much value in decentralizing a program and, and really, um, you know, figuring a way to master SOW management. I'm a realist. I realize that selling centralized SOW management or rolling it up into a more cohesive program it's not an easy task. And, you know, these three bullets here, these are just a few of the items that are required to get your company into, uh, into a situation where SOW is managed in a, in a much more enhanced, superior manner. Um, education on the benefits of this type of model, you know, um, you do need at the end of the day to say, you know, here's what's in it for us. If we can just, you know, if we can start today, we can uh, apply some efficiencies we can get to a point where, um, you know, it's giving more to us than where, you know, spending putting into in, into fixing this problem. A proper formalized plan of ownership and linkage of processes between key stakeholders. Think about collaboration. Think about, you know, um, imagining that <coughs> uh, there's a good portion of procurement execs online today. Um, and, and if so, welcome. <laughs> um, I think at the end of the day, procurement has realized the value of collaboration. They, they know um, what it means to walk across the office. If you're the CPO of your organization, you know you, it, it's beneficial for your organization to be in good terms with your CFO and for procurement and finance to be on the same page. Think about the value of that partnership and apply it to something like this. It's not just finance procurement. There are other groups like HR and IT, uh, even the CIO, as we as we will learn eventually, um, is a big um, uh, a big player in, in collaboration for managing SOW and the non-employee workforce. And then, of course, 
uh, thinking about how third parties can assist. I mean, if there was something out there that could help you do your job a lot better and it wasn't so, um, you know, uh, cumbersome or so, uh, so much of a burden that you think you could never never bring on something like automation or third-party service to, to help you manage that. You know, there are tools available. I mean, I always talk about automation in terms of uh, in being able to enact repeatable processes. I mean, at the end of the day, can you create an automated, seamless, linked program that's founded on automation that makes everyone's lives easier? I mean, when we're talking about SOW, a lot of inner workings, a lot of components there. It's budget management, it's project management, it's workforce management, it's time and expense management. Um, you know, automation is, is one of the keys to sort of linking all those processes uh, into a very seamless uh, type of program. <clears throat> Here's the plan, you know. We can say at the end of the day, we're ready if we, uh, you know, we, we can do these, these things on the screen right here. Like I'm saying, education is always the first step. We need to communicate the benefits, help others in our organization understand the value. What is the value? High-level value you have to think of. Um, being able to, uh, to streamline negotiations with uh, your service providers, uh, being able to automate all the administrative tasks like interviews and all of the other very burdensome tasks that come with managing uh, the SOW portion of your non-employee workforce. The deeper value, long-term visibility, long-term intelligence, real-time intelligence, the ability to forecast. I always say, you know, if you can make decisions about tomorrow based on the information of today, you're in a good spot. And I think that, that that's something that definitely applies to, to mastering SOW management. And like I said on the previous slide, you know, understand, you know, where, where SOW is. I mean, where are we from um, uh, spend impact? Where are we from a talent impact? And two, you know, think about your, think about project management in general. Um, if you are using uh, non-employee workforce and non-employee workers in uh, a very critical project, being able to tap into a system or a program that gives you visibility into the status of that project. You know, what are, how are we on milestones? You know, how are we on delivery dates? Uh, is that project going over budget? I mean, that's the type of information that um, can very, could be very, very helpful today. Uh, centralizing all SW activity, and I understand, Chris, is much easier said than done. But <clears throat> think of all, break down what goes into it, whether it's negotiations, contract management, invoicing, payment, workforce management, um, the administrative tasks, um, legal, all those components. Uh, by centralizing all of them under a program that's managed by either it's one group or as we're going to learn, maybe it's some type of shared ownership group, just centralizing it is going to have a, a, a great, great impact. And of course, you know, all, all comes back to visibility and intelligence. You know, what's happening now, what could possibly happen based on the intelligence we have today. <clears throat> Collaboration is huge. You know, we need to structure an ownership plan. Who owns specific capabilities? Where does the data come from? Um, you know, I think the sort of the knee-jerk reaction here is, you know, procurement and HR's coordination is really only the first step in collaboration. You know, we're going to learn that in the next section that, um, you know, it's not just these two units that are going to be a big part of mastering the art of SOW management in the future. And of course, like I said, the power of automation. Um, you know, there are some fantastic tools out there um, that can link key processes and capabilities. It creates a, a, a very ideal gateway of knowledge, intelligence, and pure process management. All of the inner workings of SOW um, can be automated and linked, um, you know, with the right tools. So <clears throat> the next frontier, I uh, told you we're going to use that phrase again. Um, you know, uh, here are some, uh, I call them secrets. Some of them you may know. Some, some of you may be, hey, that's uh, pretty interesting, Chris. We didn't think about that before. But I think, you know, regardless of where you are on the maturity scale here, um, I think these are all just very good things to, to think about um, as you go forth and, 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 and try to attack the area of SOW. Uh, secret number one, understand and know the impact of SOW. I think that too many organizations, um, you know, they, they ask themselves, you know, what's, what's the real strategic value of this? Or it doesn't really impact us, does it? And, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's not very true. It, it, it does. Like I've been talking about for a while, uh, think about the projects that are linked 
uh, to critical business objectives. And I'm not saying every single project happening across your entire organization is using uh, complex contingent labor, SOW-based uh, services or or workers in some way. Um, but I, uh, I would bet you any amount of money that there are uh, many critical, crucial um, projects going on right now that if, if mismanaged or if they're not, you know, we're not keeping an eye on the performance, uh, it will impact the business in a very negative manner. I mean, that's something I can safely say. <clears throat> uh, the specific talents and skill sets for complex initi initiatives. We're not just bringing someone on to do something very simple and then leave the organization. Um, a lot of the uh, the projects and the initiatives and the labor that's tied to uh, tied to the area of SOW, um, it they're 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 very special skill sets. It's it's a high high quality top tier level of skill sets, and that's where this avenue of talent management comes in. Or um, you know, getting like I said to take a step back. You know, I don't want to I don't want everyone to get too ahead of themselves and and think about sort of that praised higher ground where, you know, total talent management, we've all heard that phrase, where you have a program in which you have visibility and centralized management of all talent-based resources, whether it's a service, whether it's a freelancer, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a traditional FTE managed under the same banner program, using integrated technologies, integra integrated capabilities, so on and so forth. Uh, total talent management is, uh, at this point, it's an ideal. I don't think that there are many organizations out there that can say <clears throat> with some level of honesty or, you know, the numbers in, in the, uh, you know, the case study to back it up, that they have a perfect total talent management program. That is a great area to strive for. Don't get me wrong, but I think at the end of the day, uh, too many companies are sort of focused on the talent com talent component when there are other areas that they can enhance, like SOW. Um, but that is not to say we can completely abandon the idea of talent um, or um, you know talent management principles altogether, because there is that component to SOW as well. Identity management: Who are my workers? Where are my workers? <clears throat> How are they performing? Are they performing well? Our, um, our projects hitting the milestones and delivery dates. Do we have visibility into that? How compliant are we? That's a huge impact area that I think a lot of organizations um, may sometimes uh, ignore. And I know that everyone in line today, compliance is always going to be a big initiative. But um, I think that sometimes when you get down to the nitty gritty um, and you get lost sort of in the complexities and the intricacies of today's non-employee workforce, Identity management is something that can fall by the wayside. Uh, again, you know, compliance again. I know identity management and, and compliance are sort of uh, linked together, but you know, do you have some type of uh, a system or some type of initiative or some type of ongoing education even uh, about contractor compliance and labor compliance risks? You know, are we managing our workers in the right way? Um, even internal compliance. You know, are the agreements that we're signing off on? Um, you know, are they consistent with the terms and conditions of um, other SOWs or other agreements across our organization? I think that's sort of a legal management component that sometimes gets forgotten uh, in, uh, in managing SOW and centralizing SOW that shouldn't be avoided in the future. And finally, costs. I mean, we can never fully get away from costs. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, things like budgets, expenses, mismanaging projects, um, that uh, that is something that uh, can uh, have dire ramifications uh, if we if we avoid it. That's why you know there's always a spend management component to uh, to SOW. <clears throat> Predictable foundational capabilities are key. Um, any great program is going to rely on a series of capabilities, and that's really no different here. We look at Arden's uh, best in class organizations as found in our 2014-2015 research. And these are the, you know, the, the top tier organizations, you know, typically the top 20 or 25% of performers based on a series of metrics, everything from quality to visibility to cost to compliance. And you see there are um, items here like um, uh, measurement of SOW and services performance against milestone delivery dates. We've been talking about that a lot. You know, do they have, do they have the ability to, to measure the performance of, um, of your SOW-based workers. I think that's all sort of linked back to supplier performance management. I mean, that's a very core 
uh, spend management or procurement type principle that can be applied here. Centralized communication, I mean, that's huge. Think about how much time you spend in negotiations. Um, and having some sort of centralized manner of, of communicating with suppliers and negotiating with suppliers, or even having some sort of gateway. A lot of tools, that automated tools today, allow suppliers um, to, you know, to, to directly communicate with, the, you know, with you in the system on changes to an SOW or changes to scope of a project. And that's, that's something that uh, you know, we need to keep in mind, that these very predictable, uh, um, consistent capabilities um, uh, really form the foundation of a good program. Secret three, <clears throat> collaboration is vital. We all know the value of procurement, and uh, for the longest time, uh, procurement was a, uh, a big component of non-employee workforce management, and they still are. But when you think of other groups like HR with the talent management components, you think of the CIO with, with data and information and the impact of, uh, of these workers, you think of finance from a budgetary or, or of course, a financial component, a cost component. You even think of IT and, and the impact of uh, um, SOW management on, on systems and the ability to track and how integrated our technology really is. Collaboration is becoming a very core competency for not only managing the non-employee workforce, but also managing SOW as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, automation as, as the crux of uh, SOW management. Um, a lot of companies, you know, struggle today without technology, and there are companies that even may be doing just fine without technology. But as we've been talking about, um, you know, the systems like VMS are really ideal in automating certain capabilities and processes, creating um, sort of, uh, you know, consistent competencies that are, uh, can be enacted time and time again, and of course, as a gateway of intelligence. And you see here, uh, Arden's research points to VMS as, uh, as compared with uh, organizations that aren't using VMS, um, as better enabled with, with core uh, capabilities to manage SOW, from supplier performance to even to um, the streamlined financial processes and things like uh, budgetary tracking, expense tracking, and then something like supplier onboarding and offboarding, which again, I've written about this for years. It, some, some organizations just don't put a lot of time to onboarding and offboarding because they think it's a very tactical measure when, um, you know, in time and as organizations are finding, it should be more of a strategic measure. So uh, before I hand it off to Deb, I want to just unveil some very quick recommendations for action. And just a reminder, too, that, uh, um, you know, get those questions in. You know, we're going to have a few minutes at the end to address them. So <clears throat> we talked about some of the secrets, some of the insights that I've had. We talked about the evolution of the, of the non-employee workforce. What does this all mean? What are the takeaways? Uh, prioritize SIW. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. I mean, it, it's not the most exciting aspect of today's non-employee workforce, but it is vital. Um, I think we all really get lost in the sheen of talent management or total talent or total workforce, and that's great. But at this point, we need to master, um, you know, what's going on now before we can get to, uh, to higher ground. Intelligence is a gateway to knowledge and action. Um, you know, again, you know, I asked earlier, who is getting sick of the phrase big data? And we all are, but it's here. It's here to stay. Having the capabilities to drive in uh, intelligence, having the capabilities or the analytical prowess to generate information and data um, that can help us, um, you know, enact more educated decision making. Like I always say, the ability to uh, make a decision about tomorrow based on the data today is huge, and that's no different for mastering SOW. Collaborate, automate, and move forward. We all want to get to a point where talent is the biggest area of need for our programs. Talent is the biggest area for us to manage. But we can't do that unless we enact collaboration and cross-functional coordination. Like I said, it's not just a procurement game anymore. There needs to be a link to HR, the CIO's office, the CFO's office, and IT and legal as well. Um, <clears throat> Automate and move forward. Um, the tools are available. I think that, you know, telling organizations 10 years ago or 15 years ago wasn't always an easy thing to do. But as we move into a more cloud-based infrastructure, technologies become more accessible, and technology can do a lot more things as it evolves and as innovation becomes a very 
critical part of non-employee workforce management. And of course, at the end of the day, move forward. Make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, we are, as an organization, managing our non-employee workforce in such a way that we are constantly moving forward to higher ground. And with that, I'd like to hand things off to Deb before we take uh, some questions from the audience. Deb, you may be on mute. So Chris, if we could go to the next slide. Sure. Okay, thanks. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what DCR sees in working with clients. We find, as Chris mentioned earlier, that most clients who are centralizing SOW management do, in fact, establish an internal professional services group, sometimes called a PSG, that they use to manage their programs. And the group typically consists of individuals, as Chris mentioned, from procurement, IT, but also contracts, human resources, and line management. Line managers typically, historically, have been the ones who have been in control of projects. So they're certainly a part of the team. They, as a group, tend to implement more of a shared services model in which they use a third-party tool to manage the whole SOW program. They look to the managed service provider to take responsibility for onboarding and offboarding the suppliers, but they retain direct responsibility for contracts and for payments to the suppliers. Slightly different model. Now, there are some really important implications to this shared services model that are really quite different from a traditional contingent workforce management program. So let's start with a selection of suppliers. Most projects break down into sub-projects. Each has its own supplier list, its own statement of work, own rates. Clients typically have to go through a process of choosing special specialty suppliers that are right for each sub-project or phase of the project. Considering that most companies report to us that for every dollar they spend on staff augmentation, they spend five to eight dollars on project outsourced project services, this is a very important spend and it's important that they pick the right suppliers. The relationship they establish with their suppliers is different as well. Suppliers in, in projects are expected to play a much greater role than in a traditional contingent workforce environment. And direct continuous communication between the client and the suppliers is critical, where in a traditional staff augmentation system, quite often there's no direct communication between the two. For large projects, clients often engage a relatively small number of very strategic suppliers, typically maybe five to 10, and every supplier establishes a program management office with resources that may be on-site as well as off-site. Large projects also often involve onshore and offshore suppliers. And that's important because, in some cases, the supplier may work both onshore and offshore. This involves tracking different rates, different engagement structures, different compliance requirements based upon where the supplier is working at any given point in time. We also need to note that a single supplier may be simultaneously engaged by a company for a number of different projects. Every project, again, has its own requirements, its own rates, its own levels of effort, own contractual terms, all of which have to be managed individually for the project, while the client also manages the supplier's overall performance across all of these projects. So if time and effort isn't accurately and properly charged to the right project, the right cost codes, that company may be at risk of a supplier double dipping or other problems. Project management has to account for the entire project. Now, internal employees and others not paid through the system may be members of the project team. So to understand the full picture, clients really need to account for all efforts, meaning they have to be able to track billable as well as non-billable resources and hours. And in many cases, payments tied to different multiple payment systems, so clients are getting fragmented views of an overall project. And they need these systems to be integrated together, delivering more of a holistic view and overall control. All of this points to why a technology solution that was 
designed for a traditional contingent workforce, VMS, uh, just doesn't really work. Straight rec to check doesn't really apply here. A true SOW management platform really has to be able to handle multiple projects, resources that are splitting their time on different projects, each with different rates, different contract terms. So clients need to really be able to manage projects from two perspectives. They need to have overall control over any given project, but they also need to manage the full picture of the activities of any given supplier. And if the system can't provide this level of analysis and control, clients at risk of a failed project. So let me quickly hit on the highlights of what we're doing for our clients, talk a little bit about DCR's SOW solution. Our solution is supported by our technology, SmartTrack. So we provide support for a complete approach from soliciting suppliers to establishing contractual agreements to overseeing the execution of the project. This starts with an online ability to create a request for a proposal, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. SmartTrack can handle complexities described in the last slide. So it handles multiple projects simultaneously working on different projects with a single supplier, onshore, offshore, billable and non-billable resources. Of course, the pricing model that a client chooses to apply to each supplier agreement is really dependent upon what the supplier is going to do, what work will be done, or what service will be performed. So SmartTrack can, within a given project, manage time and materials, fix price, fix deliverable arrangements where payment is authorized and milestones are met. And of course, many of our clients use project management tools, so we seamlessly integrate with these tools in order to synchronize projects, phases, tasks, budgets, actual spend, and project completion. So I mentioned before um, the ability the importance of the ability to find and engage the right suppliers for every project phase or task. So SmartTrack provides a pretty comprehensive and extremely comprehensive e-procurement module. So if we look at the next slide, you'll see that um, our system creates an online proposal request. So the requester can pretty easily identify the questions to be asked and the accompanying documentation that a potential supplier would need to provide, determine the list of possible suppliers and distribute the proposal request to those suppliers, needs to be able to establish and communicate the terms governing the whole process, certainly needs to be able to accept responses, score the responses based upon weightings established by the requester, has to be able to take the responses and move them out to the reviewers and then generate short lists based upon reviewer assessments. And when suppliers are selected for every element of the project, their responses need to be incorporated into the SOW for that phase of the project. Finding agreements have to be established with selected vendors, and that's done using online documentation and e-signatures. Of course, complete management requires analytics and tools. So three critical features of every DCR program. First, the ability to conduct a feasibility analysis. Right up front, you really want to know, is an outsourced project the most effective way to get the job done? Second is to proactively track funding and headcount allocations across and within business units. So at all times, you really need to know who's working on the project, what's been accomplished, what's been spent, how much money remains in the budget, and third, you need approvals for carryovers. Many projects span fiscal budgets, resulting in funding headaches, unnecessary uh, approval cycles, excessively high failure risk. So SmartTrack anticipates the need for carryovers, and it supports a process that really allows our clients to move forward, maintaining momentum. So very quickly, of course, Chris and I have just covered the tip of the iceberg in terms of the challenges of SOW management and wanted to tell you that DCR does offer regular webinars in which we take a much deeper dive into any of the aspects that we've touched on today. So if you're interested in learning more or participating in any of these future webinars, please let us know and we'd be happy to um, answer any specific questions you have or have you participate in, in those webinars. It is 1.59. We have a very brief amount of time uh, for 
answering questions. We do have a few questions queued up that we will uh, respond to in writing. Uh, one of the questions, we'll take one question right now, Chris, and then you could tell us, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, the question is, any, do you have any recommendations for how to increase capabilities to find the highly skilled IT resources needed for projects? Hmm, it's uh, more of an intricate question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think part of uh, the art of mastering SOW or um, enhancing this part of any company's, you know, contingent workforce program and unemployed workforce program is understanding what types of labor are going to be managed and getting to the core of, um, you know, uh, what types of talent are actually going to uh, be a part of the program and what's going to be included and what's not. Um, it's It sounds like this is more of a uh, blending uh, scenario where, um, you know, you may want to uh, figure out a better way of, uh, you know, what the talent engagement portion of the program looks like, because um, that's what it sounded like the question was around attracting um, or, or, yeah, something about attracting high, that high quality uh, IT talent. Um, I mean, I think that goes a little bit deeper than than SRW. I mean, I think that's more of a more of a question about how to how to engage or find talent. Um, I think most organizations today, and I'll try to make this quick, um, are, uh, are aren't doing a good enough job of uh, of of figuring out where their best resources are or where their sources of talent. Um, you know, when you think of things like online labor marketplaces or freelancer job boards or uh, even like social networks and social media. Um, I think organizations have to do have to spend the time. I spent, you know, I spent so much time today talking about how important SOW and how important some of those more tactical and the strategic capabilities really are. And companies uh, should not, I mean, should need to prioritize talent management, but should take a step back and focus on SOW. But this sounds like a specific situation where, um, you know, it's not a bad thing to understand, you know, where those sources of labor are and what's the best engagement method. I mean, for some companies, more traditional methods, you know, whether it's personal networks or staffing suppliers is always a way to go. Uh, but, you know, as our research has found, especially over the past couple of years, um, things like labor marketplaces and freelancer networks, um, that that's a huge source of talent today. And, um, you know, those are, you know, companies need to tap into them. Okay. Clearly, you know, at DCR, Many of our clients uh, also find themselves in a position of looking for hard to find resources. So we will take the rest of the questions and submit written responses to all of you who are were gracious enough to participate in the call. And I will add to what Chris just said with some additional thoughts as to how to find additional high, highly sought after IT talent. So before we close, one moment. Chris would like to uh, talk to you a little bit about a research study. Yes, uh, thanks for everyone who's uh, still on the line today. And, uh, you know, uh, as Deb had said, any questions we didn't get to today, there's a bunch in the queue. Uh, we promise we will get to you uh, via email. We're happy to do that. Um, I am in the midst of uh, launching our Arden's third annual State of Contingent Workforce Research Study. I know that many of you have participated in the research in the past or, or have definitely read read the report. Um, I'd love it if uh, anyone has 15 minutes to spare uh, to visit the URL on your screen. It's uh, tiny.cc slash CWM. It's a 15-minute survey. We'd love to have people participate if they have the time. Anyone who does participate um, will receive a complimentary copy of the report uh, in October. And this is, you know, at, at companies that have uh, read the report in the past, this really is the official guidebook for the next year of non-employee workforce management. So again, tiny.cc slash CWM. Uh, anyone who can spare the time, I would appreciate it. So with that, we will close uh, today's webinar. Contact information is on the screen if you think of additional questions and want to reach out to Chris or myself. We will be following up, as we indicated, with sending each of you the slides and the uh, access to the online recording. And we really thank you for your time and your attention. And with that, we'll close the webinar.